It's Monday the 22nd of June and uh, I'm on a little bit of a vacation. I thought this would be a great spot to spend my first night. It's pretty local, I've fished here before, never camped here before and we may even have some visitors later as motorhomes tend to camp here because it's a flat place and they are able to kind of steady themselves out. Need to get set up fairly quickly. The longer you spend in a location, the more the old flies move in on you, and it's only ever going to cool down. And the cooler it gets, the more of them they'll be out. So if I'm set up before it cools down, at least I know that I've got somewhere to chill. Things get too intense, but most of the time uh, they're not so bad. I'm packed up pretty light for this trip. Normally my wife and son join me, but uh, he's only four months old. And uh, we tried a few camping trips with him. And sadly, it's just going through a few phases where he's not sleeping great. His teeth are coming through and he's kind of going through a bit of brain development. He gets very easily stimulated. And when he come out on camping trips like this with a little baby, there's a lot of stimulation. And also the perpetual light, the constant daylight at this time of year, it doesn't get dark. Um, it's, it's pretty tough to try and put him down. But as the flies are moving in on me, this is something that you can use if you come to a country like this. Um, it's called Thermocell. It's by no means something I discovered. It's by something that everyone around here told me about and now I finally decided to buy one. And it does work. It's like a little electronic device like that. You put a tablet in. That's an old tablet. You screw this into the top of the, um, the power gas, which is like a pr propane mix. And it's supposed to clear away the flies for about 20 meters squared, and it does work. It's just that some flies it doesn't work on. But the mosquitoes... There we go. So you look through that little hole, now it's lit. And that'll start to release a kind of really nice substance that the flies don't like. We'll put it in there, let it build up. Okay. That's pretty much everything set up. The bedroom's looking pretty good. I've just opened up two of the windows just to air things out a bit. It's pretty hot up there. Although it does tend to cool down nicely at night, which is one of the pluses of summer up here in Sweden. Very hot at the moment, but it will cool off. But I don't think I'm gonna put the awning out. I have an awning with a, an ARB awning with a room. 
it's like a fully enclosed room and we mainly bought that for uh, for our son so the flies weren't going to be hammering them all the time while we traveled you know i don't think i need it tonight there's pl certainly enough shelter and uh, you know if the flies get really bad i'll just go up in the roof tent and uh, grin and bear it for the time being but i am pretty hungry so i think i might cook myself something to eat and then see if i can do some fishing and maybe take the boat out My food setup is uh, about uh, well, a couple of weeks you can normally have in here. That's, uh, I say I've got about, let's say seven days in there now. Some things are perishable, so they need to be eaten sooner than others. I don't travel with a fridge. And um, you know, a lot of this stuff in here actually is vegetarian apart from eggs and such. And you know, maybe I buy meat on the way and I have it the same day. I would like a fridge maybe here along this side where the electronics are. Um, and then hardwire it in to the leisure battery, not, not through one of these sockets. And uh, that'd be good actually for sort of milk and eggs and things like that. But in here is all the kind of cutlery and stuff. You can just take that bucket out. I tried to consolidate a lot of things I carry. Uh, we've got washing up stuff here, more washing up stuff. Bit of loo roll. See that just lives in the alley box anyway. And bin bags, they can go to the side, but all the cutlery is in the bag for cooking in here we've got a kettle and we've got all the tea and the mugs inside the kettle uh, chopping board just something for the table when the kettle's hot and we have a couple of pans here one actually is a frying pan well I don't really use it much it mostly gets used as a lid this is the cooking set I use I used to use a double burner with a grill and this is a, a grill a folding grill called the bitty big Q, which is actually really cool. Good for fish on an open fire, we'll use that later. And a couple of plates, and that's kind of it really. And then the rest in here is the food. One plus on this bucket as well is uh, when you run into trouble with the Jeep, which is inevitable, uh, you've got something to catch fluids with. I know that may not sound like you might need it, but trust me, you really do if a radiator hose goes, if it's dripping oil, if something has gone wrong with it. It's good to be able to catch the fluids and dispose of them rather than it just go off out into wherever you are in, in nature. So, uh, you know, helps helps with a lot of stuff actually. But I think tonight I'm gonna to cook some pasta with some mackerel. We got some chickpeas too, and a little bit of paprika pesto. Gonna mix it all together, pretty simple meal, quite filling, and then a cup of tea and some biscuits. And I think it's uh, gonna be some fishing and we can fish to, all through the night. That's the great thing about this time of year. Never gets dark, always pretty warm. So there we go, very simple meal, very filling, and uh, pretty tasty actually. This is how you give yourself more washing up to do. I need haze outdoors here, all hazy. Take a dunk. I'm gonna take a dunk in the morning. Freshen up in the lake slash river actually. A lot of fish out there. I've had dinner, I've done some housekeeping, washed up. Fired up the thermosel again, I turned it off for a while actually, see what would happen. And uh, yeah, a lot of flies have arrived really, so that's back on. Just gonna have a tea, a few biscuits, I know it's a bit cliche, and then try and do some fishing.
this first time I've used the boat it's uh, just a blow up Seahawk 3 and this was actually gifted to me by a gentleman out there that I met not long ago he was traveling Sweden and he's from Germany and he stopped off at the house and he said you know I'll um I know you've been after a boat and I've had this for a while I've never never really used it much and you can have it so Chris if you're out there and you're watching mate thank you very much I mean I obviously didn't accept it for free I refused and I gave him a nice uh, frame pack and also in exchange for some leather work too which I'm doing for him so hopefully he'll benefit from that more than the boat but uh, I've always wanted a, just a boat really to go in the back of the Jeep and uh, as much as I'm partial to a full-size canoe or a folding canoe but I can't really afford anything like that and I'm not prepared to drag a trailer um, I don't really want a trailer because um, a lot of the tracks here are pretty narrow and, uh, and as people I spoke to before have trailers um, you go up some tracks you find out it's a dead end you've got to reverse all the way down with the trailer or disconnect the trailer and try to get it into the ditch and then reconnect it. It can be very difficult on your own in some of these tight tracks around the wilderness here. And it's not always trailer friendly. You know, the, some, some of these uh, tracks there, they're not designed to be turned around in and they've been blocked off by boulders and all sorts of things. I had one earlier today. I traveled up it thinking I was going to the top of a mountain with a beautiful view. There was a fence straight across the track, like a reindeer fence for the Sami. And obviously that's their patch. And you know, I, I had to back reverse all the way back down the mountain it took me quite a bit of time and with a trailer it can be quite difficult yeah. got a feeling this is going to take a while Never portage an inflatable before. It's like driving on 35s. Smart. Very, very slight wind, obviously, and the boat is drifting well away from base camp. But that's okay, we can always go back there. Lots of fish around, but they're taking the mayfly. I've got a very noisy reel that needs cleaning. Been out fishing for a little while now. It's just a small perch. It's actually a very small perch. Perch I did pretty well yesterday on the perch. I had some uh, 30 centimetres, which is quite nice actually.
Oh, that was a strange night. That's the first night in a long time where I've slept all through the night. Weirdly, I feel worse for it, but, uh, you know, maybe my body's just in shock that it didn't wake up to, to our little baba screaming or wriggling around. But I'm trying to have a lion, but my body clock is not allowing that. It's 6 a.m., which I think is a, a good time to get up. A few problems last night with the rooftop tent mattress. It's deflated very slightly on me, and uh, it's got a bit hard. Kind of concerned there's a leak. I'm going to have to check that. Another scorcher of the day, 28, 30, so uh, get the sunblock on, but first I might take a swim. Stuck in, man. There's some pretty hefty pros and cons to this kind of setup uh, that I use. This, this sort of traditional style rooftop tent that, that folds away like this. Some of the pros are the cost. It's uh, very inexpensive. In the world of rooftop tents, it certainly is expensive, but in the world of rooftop tents, this isn't an expensive rooftop tent. Um, it's weight is the main factor. This is uh, 43 kilos, this whole setup's here, including the bedding, let's say, uh, let's say 55 kilos. Um, so that's extremely light. I mean, a lot of the rooftop tents weigh around 90, 100 kilos. The pop-ups can weigh even more. Um, the downside's really, well, another pro is space. They have a lot more room inside than a pop-up as well. But the downsides can be unpacking, packing it away. It takes time. When you're doing it day after day after day, sometimes it can be pretty laborious. Um, when we travelled, me and my wife, for a few months, and we were setting up every day, there would be times where we just like, I just want to stay here today again, because, you know, putting up and taking down the camp all the time, you know, for days on end can, it can be quite annoying and uh, you know it kind of wears thin after a while um, 
you know, it's a good setup really, but uh, the pop-ups are much, much easier to put away. But again, it's the weight, you know, they're, they're around over a hundred kilos, some of them, they're, and they're very expensive too. Um, so uh, yeah, there we go. Pros and cons really. One of the pros of having a rooftop tent is you never ever look for flat ground. The Jeep can be heavily articulated um, on really uneven terrain and you've got a flat bed and you're up high, you get some air. It's quite a liberating feeling really. Um, it feels like you're going upstairs to go to bed, which is quite nice. This can actually connect to the rooftop tent and basically just hang down on one side like this. Um, the only irritating thing about that is you have to factor in accessibility to these doors. This is obviously then going to be really difficult and there, there isn't enough room for me to roll this up under the tent for it to clear the doors. So I'm always kind of fighting with that. But as I'm traveling solo, I don't often need to go in here because this is usually my wife's things in the front here and obviously clothing and stuff and all of her kit in the side there, the baby gear as well. You know, so there tends to be the more you track, the more of you traveling, the more room you need for equipment, obviously. So I think I am going to thread this in just to make my life a bit easier. So that's kind of what you end up with when you hang it through as, as it's designed to be. Old Flopsy McVale skin hanging down. And that isn't a big deal. I can still get in here. Yeah, that's fine. Now if I take a bit of time over it, yeah, it's, not, it's not the end of the world. But also if you're traveling in a country where it rains a lot, you, you really should have it like that. Because this side that tucks in here seals off the internal bedding from the wind blowing in and the moisture blowing in when you're driving down the road at high speeds. So you really need to factor that in. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's gonna help keep the temps down inside the truck, I guess. When zipping it up, you really need to take care that you don't catch the fabric. Sometimes I put my finger behind the zip and just go along like this. If you catch the fabric, you can obviously make a hole in it. I caught it the first time I bought the tent. I caught the fabric and uh, now obviously yeah, I was a bit upset because I had a little hole in it. I managed to fix it, but uh, it's just pays to take care really. Well, that's me all packed up here just my first night pretty pretty easy and I got to test out the boat as well which was really cool really love the boat so uh, thanks again Chris and I've said thanks a million times but I'm genuinely very grateful but I'm going to rejoin the road now and make my way north and uh, yeah we'll see how the journey goes maybe I find a really good camp spot along the way and I stop early or maybe I drive for another four or five hours and see where I end up. I think if I do that, I will be in the north, but uh, the real north, we'll see. So uh, I'm gonna get on the road and make a move.
little bit of recon up here, found this track. It goes up the mountain, it's not on the map. Looks pretty well used. Very wet. Oh, I had a lot of wheel spinach actually. It's starting to get overgrown, you can see why it's really damp. This ground here looks bad. It's pretty much all bog. Drying out a bit. Dip. Of course, getting getting crazy now. Getting a little bit nasty. Yeah, I'm all right. We're out of here. That's just it's just turned into uh, to something else. I'm trying to turn around at this spot here just because it's the, the best spot to turn around and there's a white pole in front of me so this has clearly been used as a track before but time to get out of here in fact there's a load of scaffold pole just there so at once upon a time this became was supposed to be something and it looks like uh, it's been long forgotten Here we go. Cool track though. I have to record that on Guy on the way back. driving for about two hours mostly forest roads gravel roads and they get a bit tiring after a while when you're trundling down them you don't really make a lot of progress very quickly because you can't go extremely quick on them at a normal highway speed and you probably notice i got a real rattle with my front end you know something knocking and i drove up one of the trails and um i kind of managed to identify what that was and uh Basically, it's the engagement on the heim, the thread, going into the actual control arm. It appears to be a bit loose. Um, so I'm going to need to uh, go to a shop. There's a town up here called Villamina, quite a big town. It's actually not far from Orsula, so you can see how long it's taken me to get here on the forest road. If you know the area, it's quite, taken quite a long time. Um, I'm going to go to a, to a DIY shop, try and get a spanner. Um, an adjustable big spanner that, that will fit on these nuts, on these adjustable control arms. And I'm going to try and tighten them up because I think they've somehow worked loose over time because this noise hasn't been there all the time. It's, it's kind of appeared over the last week and, um, and just tighten them up. But uh, it's something I'm definitely going to need to have a closer look at when I get home because, um, you know, driving tough trails all the time with that rattle, it's only going to, going to lead to a failure and it's going to be real bad when it does fail because it's a lower control arm. So uh, yeah, we're gonna carry on to Vilamina.
very beautiful location, but I don't think I'm going to stay here. I've travelled about 200 kilometres north from the location I camped at last night, and uh, I really want to try and make some progress heading north. This road I'm on the E45, uh, it's not very interesting in terms of uh, beautiful wilderness locations. It's not like the Wildmarksvergen that we did last week where you've got incredible waterfalls and views of the fjells, snow-covered mountains and a few more interesting trails that we went down that are kind of inaccessible for most homes and such. This is more kind of a main road taking you to the north, you know, sort of efficiency in that respect. If I go west towards the fjells, a lot of the roads that take you west, they don't link up with roads that take you to the north. And that's the thing you have to know about traveling Sweden. A lot of the roads that kind of branch off there, it, some, some of them just end. And uh, you have to go all the way back to be able to go up again because, you know, you've got a huge river or a lake or, or something there stopping you. Or you cross the border to Norway, for example, which you can't do at the moment. So sometimes you can go into Norway and back into Sweden further up and that works. But in this case, I'm kind of confined to Sweden, not in a bad way, but just in a kind of logistics way with the roads because of the coronavirus. But I'm lucky enough to travel anyway. You know, given uh, I'm sort of just keeping myself to myself. But interestingly enough, I fixed the problem with the rattle at the front end. I stopped in a in a place in Vilhelmina, and the guys at Mechanomen helped me out very, very kind. They lent me um, a big spanner, adjustable one, a huge metal pipe, and I got everything tightened up and adjusted there in the parking place. And, um, you know, it was uh, pretty good, actually. And then I went to the shop over the road and bought myself... An adjustable spanner, a Baco one. It was very expensive, mine, but you know that's that's why I work for a living, and I'd rather have it in the Jeep so I can be independent, because it is an adjustable after all. But I don't think I'm staying here. I'm going to head further north. This is a great spot. I've marked it on Gaia. If I ever come back with Meg or friends, you know, this will be on the map. We can come here, put the boat in the water, or fish, or whatever. And uh, it's good to know it's here. A um, bit, of, bit of reconnaissance, it's always, uh, always a good thing. But anyway, I'm going to keep going north. I found a nice little spot. It's one of these communal areas for travellers where you can just pull in and get off the beaten track a little bit, do some camping. Apparently no tents though, just RVs and camper vans and things like that. And I've seen a lot of those signs actually while I've been around here in northern Sweden. And uh, yeah, it's just interesting that, I guess it's because you can camp anywhere with a tent, but with an RV and a camper, you can't exactly do that. But yeah, I've, I've found a nice spot anywhere. I'm going to spend just the night here and break up my, my travels as I work out where I'm going to go. I've had to deploy the ARB full awning room because the mosquitoes have absolutely hammered me. It's not something I like to put up too often because it does take a bit of work to put it up. I'm just off the E45 and I'll mark this location on the map. It's a really nice place if you're traveling Sweden and you just want to kind of break from the, the, the wild camping, so to speak, um, out in the mountains and such. You just need, need somewhere where you can just chill with a little bit of uh, some shops and things. You know, like I've bought this smoked fish, which is a delicacy here. It's basically like a smoked trout, really. And uh, they say the way they do it is the best in Sweden, so they claim. And you have this cold with some bread with a little bit of this sauce here. I'm looking forward to that and make some tea and just chill out for the night, maybe do some fishing as well. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'm gonna end it here and uh, you'll see me again as I travel further north on the next video. So uh, take care and thanks for watching.
Well, it's uh, Wednesday, the 24th of June, and I'm still making my way north. In the last video, you saw me at that rest stop, where uh, you know, it's sort of like a caravan-friendly place where I had the smoke fish. And I spent the night there, and I recuperated and managed to Skype uh, Meg and, and see the little baby and everything and say hi, which was nice. And then I made my way further north. I spent that night actually looking at Gaia and uh, planning um, some particular camps that I liked the look of. It's always difficult to know what they're going to be like until you get there. But uh, currently I've been exploring a network of tracks essentially. Um, some of which are on the map, lots of them are not on the map. I've just stumbled across someone's someone's camper. I don't know whether they're here or not, but uh, I mean, why these areas though? This is pretty, this is in the middle of flipping nowhere really. If we look on the map, we're right in the heart of the forest. And um, man, the flies. But let's go take a look. I wonder if anyone's there. place has been trashed. I ain't gonna get too close. It's been, uh, been trashed. Clearly a long time ago, this track was in use and people could drive across it. But the problem you've got now is these logs actually make it even worse because as we come down here, my tire's going to go in there. A friend of mine back home, who I miss dearly, actually, he's a East Nor well, he was an East Nor Land Rover instructor and he always said to me, when in doubt, walk it. And uh, still to this day, I don't always follow that guidance, as I have just done. Now I've driven down here, and uh, I've got to try and reverse up, and probably reverse all the way back. So, uh, yeah, sorry Neil. If you do come to Sweden in a four-wheel drive, you'll obviously have access to a much broader range of, of wilderness than if you come in an RV. The RVs are not going to be able to come into places like this. And I think that's the, the attraction for me of, of having a four-wheel drive. It's a bit like a backpack when, when you do bushcraft or hiking. This is kind of like a mobile backpack. You can go anywhere with it, essentially, uh, provided you build it that, that way and you can pitch the tent on the roof and you can camp and that's that's an attractive thing to be able to do especially when you travel with family and you want somewhere comfortable for family to be but what i will say is if you do come to the country and, and this kind of thing is, is your interest is, is to really stick to the, the the actual tracks and not the track we just drove past which is essentially a logging trail where a massive machine has gone down with chained tires to pull out timber for example um, and you can tell the difference because the track is so much wider it looks fairly normal but when you go on it you suddenly find one wheels up in the end the others in the ditch because your vehicle's not wide enough for the track but you're not really meant to be on them you see that those tracks are, are long forgotten now the job's done the tracks there it's gonna the forest will regrow you know that, that's what they're there for but tracks like we're on now it's wide enough for a normal vehicle um, you know, it's obviously a track that somebody built or drove up to put their their trashed uh, trailer up I don't know maybe, maybe once upon a time that was probably used for something maybe it was used for the forest guys who worked here and, and now it's kind of been left and, and forgotten
should be reaching the end of this track now and I really hope it's uh, it's worth the effort. I mean, it's been fun doing a lot of this exploring, it really has. It's good to get it out of your system, but uh, I've got a feeling it will not be what I think it is. In fact, I think this is the end. Let's just check Gaia. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're coming to the end. I think if there was a lake here, the opportunity for some fishing and uh, I would absolutely spend some time here regardless of how little progress I've made sort of travelling to the to the mountains up north but uh, yeah I mean you should certainly wouldn't want to break down here because uh, that's that's one of the I think the major problems really would be you'd be waiting a while for someone to come and get you I think you know a couple of days for my someone I knew to, to sort of come along but we've got like a hiking trail here probably goes down to a lake you can see plenty of uh, of European elk trot down here quite regularly goes all the way down there so uh, I might get my boots on a little while after I've had a cup of tea and take a hike see where it goes Let us see what you do, Thermosel. Come on. Prove to me that you're not a waste of money. That's all I ask you. It's not a lot, is it? I used to use a camping gas double burner on our first trip. We had that particular camp kitchen in the vehicle. And I built it into the drawer system and we had a gas bottle as well that was uh, behind the passenger seat, which was very unsafe. And then later that moved up into the roof rack. You know, it's stored on top of the roof rack and that was, that was good. But now I just use this and I picked this up from a fuel station for about the equivalent of 25 pounds. So it's not very expensive. I'm pretty sure you can find this very same one on eBay. And, uh, and, I, and I quite like it. I tend to do one pot meals and um, mix things together when I'm out camping, quite simple. Or I grill with things like this frying pan I've got in here that you see me do the breakfast on. You do have the ability to make a fire wherever you wherever you want, basically, in, in some contexts, but you've got to think how dry it is here right now. And, uh, you know, you make a fire on the ground. Fires often creep under the ground. I mean, I've talked about this and I've even shown it on the Bushcraft channel where you dig down after a fire, after a couple of days camping in one spot or even a night. And you go down, you know, this far and the ground's still hot, still warm. You're still pouring water in. And um, it's how forest fires start amongst other things. It's good to have a little stove and I'm trying to keep the setup very simple in the vehicle because this vehicle can be used to pick people up from the airport. It's a four seater as well as being used as an overland vehicle as a force if four people were in it now it'd be way over gvm be extremely heavy with me in it and this equipment in i'm, I'm very safely under gvm but you've got to remember a, a normal person is anywhere between sort of 55 to 100 kilos these days so uh, depending on you know male female whatever so you know, that can push the weight up pretty pretty tremendously with meg on board and my son, I'm still just under GVM with this setup, but uh, big gas bottles, lots of cooking equipment, big stove, uh, you know, loads of different things on board. You know, it, it just all adds up. It really does all add up. So I tried to keep the vehicle pretty streamlined and I find that, um, you know, I get good fuel economy, about 27 miles per gallon, which is extremely poor by today's standard, but for a vehicle like that, it's really good. And the way to get that even better would be to re-gear the vehicle. I'm on 410 gears at the moment, obviously front and back. Um, that's not really sufficient with the 35 inch tire with this 2.5 turbo diesel engine. Really you want 488, 
then you got much more fuel economy back you know probably looking at about 30 33 miles per gallon we used to get 36 miles per gallon out of this with uh, 32s on 410 gears so it makes a big difference going to a 35 really and and loading the truck up obviously for a trip really sort of took some uh, economy off my uh, vehicle there but it's to be expected really you've got to factor that in when you do a trip like this Beautiful little stream. Lots of horse tail. Oh, you can see the, the land has slipped away just behind me here. That's always the danger when you you drive on some of these tracks and things where the ground is extremely dry and you've got very cold winters and things. It's uh, not such a, a wise move sometimes to just plough straight into things with a with your vehicle thinking you can go anywhere when it starts to go wrong there's often no going back yeah this is very nice it's going to be mere cow though that's for sure definitely an old vehicle track comes around here they obviously laid some wood down See how deep the water is. Got the animal tracks everywhere and they've carried on using it. And then we get into this kind of swampy grassland here. Time to return to the vehicle, had a good look around, nice place, but uh, yeah, I mean just taking a lot of damage from the mozzies, <laughs> they're uh, sort of three, four, five on my arm, sort of every, every two seconds, just straight back on, brush them away, kill them, straight more, straight back on, they're just following me around because I smell like, uh, it's like someone's airdropped uh, a crate full of McDonald's into like an apocalyptic situation where everybody's starving and uh, you know, everyone's just, ah, just ravaging it, you know, killing each other for McDonald's. It's kind of like that. Lots of friends. Never travel alone in Sweden. Again, very beautiful place. It's nice to find these places. I mean, obviously I didn't discover it. I'm not, not Christopher Columbus, but what I mean is just, just coming out here and finding these places, discovering them for yourself. A little cabin though. Maybe somewhere, someone has a boat or something like that. Yeah, there's a boat inside. Kind of a nice looking one too. Fair play. back and couldn't help but check out another track. Looks like there's a old building here. I mean uh, possibly an old Stuga that somebody owned. Some people have been here smoking fags and 
you know, nice, nice stove. Nice stove, but uh, it's a shame, really. It's uh, it's in disarray. It's in disarray, but uh, yeah, shall leave that shut. I go back on the, the gravel roads I'm gonna air up to about 25 psi and I've also reconnected the anti-roll bar just for safety reasons Nice little track just off the gravel road and a parking spot, a little grill pit. Someone obviously comes and takes their boat out here. Really beautiful place, nice bird song. There's even a toilet, but uh, that's long forgotten. Well, I've decided I'm going to stay here. I uh, just spoke to one of my friends who lives just uh, east of Yokmok and northeast a little bit and uh, I'm planning on seeing him either tomorrow or Friday and just going to stay with them for the day and, and catch up and uh, yeah I think I'm going to stop here because there's no rush to get up there and this is a really really beautiful location I love the sound of the water as well that'll help me sleep and the temperatures have really dropped it's uh it's just so much nicer than it was further south, you know, sort of knocking on 30 degrees C up here. It's probably more like in the 20s, which is uh, which is very nice. So probably not going to set the awning up. Probably just going to get the rooftop tent open, uh, cook myself some dinner. There's a lovely breeze. So as long as I'm cooking here, the flies will probably leave me alone. And uh, yeah, I'll just level the vehicle out because it's a bit skew if and we'll set camp up. to get the thermocell fired up again to deter the unwanted because they're moving in
loads of tadpoles. Loads of them. And just ignore the bacon fat floating on the surface. Very quiet on this lake, fish wise. Lots of mayfly on the water as well, nothing's even taking them. And it's a perfect time of day, nice and mild temperatures, you know, not too hot. It's perfect really, and lots of frogs too, I'd expect to see pike. But uh, nothing, very shallow as well, about a metre. I mean, maybe, maybe if I go all the way out there, Things would be a bit different, but in all honesty, it's just nice to be on the water. Just relaxing. Got to try a little bit, you know, this is into the grass. The grass is always good. On the old damsel in distress technique. Oh, I thought it was a fish. I thought it was a fish. But it was just salad. So that's me for the night now. I had a little paddle around, so I'm happy. And uh, no fish though, but very shallow. Amazing how far I went out and it was still around about a metre, loads of frogs, loads of mayfly on the water, but nothing's, nothing's interested, you know, usually you get pike, you get perch, all sorts of things, and uh, yeah, well, you know, we'll just have a look in the morning, see what the activity is, but it's perfect time now, really, but so I'm just going to ritualistically, that's the correct word, make a cup of tea for the morning and put it in the flask. Uh, I always do that because um, then the first thing in the morning when I wake up, I've got hot tea, you know, it helps me, uh, helps me start the day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm just gonna go to bed. It's about 10 a.m. at night. You can see the sun still there and it will remain. It'll probably just teeter down a little bit and then uh, yeah, it'll get, it won't get dark, but it, you know you notice a slight drop in light but I've been eating pretty good whilst I was on the lake there so uh, yeah lost a couple of pints of blood but uh, yeah it's been a been a really nice day I've really enjoyed it and uh, I was, I'm kind of ready to head a bit further north now when I was on the E45 two days ago I was kind of feeling a little bit bummed out because I couldn't find good places to camp and you know it's not very scenic but as soon as you start branching off those main roads and you start going through the, the small towns and I feel like you see a little bit more of, of what the country's about. You see fine beautiful places like this, you find a lot of trails, a lot of nature reserves, areas where you can buy fishing cards and go fishing and it's just more about you know what Sweden is really in the north. So uh, we'll see what tomorrow brings and uh, good night. It's the morning, 
I'm not used to all these unbroken nights of sleep. I think my body's in shock. I'm getting a getting a full eight hours. It's uh, feeling pretty chilled. Gotta be honest. It's nice. There's no rush to wake up and just the sound of the river. It's beautiful. But it's a nice day. We had some rain last night, which I think was needed. Actually, real dry, real dusty. Give the give the gear and the jeep and everything a bit of a wash, so uh, that's always good. A lot of humidity building up in the bag as you sleep in it day by day and as it's folded in the roof tent it doesn't really get much air so I've just hung it out in the in the sun and the breeze just to crisp it off a bit same with some clothes but uh, I'm gonna jump in the lake now and uh, wash some clothes of my own and myself I know this t-shirt tan it's sick right it's gonna be cold Ooh, actually that ain't too bad. He says, lowering himself in very slowly. Oh. What a wimp. Hayes would not be proud of me. He would not be proud. Oh, it's very soft. I'm... Whoa! Soft ground. I think I better just get straight in before I sink. Here. Very windy this morning, hopefully you can hear me in the microphone, it's not being battered around, but uh, it's a perfect day for some housekeeping. The wind is not cold by any means, it's very warm. And uh, it's a pretty nice day actually, so I've air dried off from my swim, had a bit of a wash, washed the clothes, and uh, they're all drying, airing out the sleeping bag, and uh, some breakfast, and uh, then I'm going to get packed up and be on my way, so kind of taking the opportunity while you can to just replenish everything, and uh, yeah, feel a bit fresher. I'm going to head northwest for a while and then I'm going to loop back round under Yokmok and go and visit my friend in a couple of days. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to do some more exploring, find some more nice camp locations and try and head in the direction of the fjells, see some mountain views and uh, yeah, and just, just see some sights and sounds really, find some nice camp locations. But I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I've spent a bit of time in this location, longer than I normally would when I intend to make some progress north, but I had a lot of housekeeping to do, and to be honest, it's such a nice place that, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to say goodbye to these places when you're comfortable. But uh, thanks for watching. I'm going to end this episode here, and I'll see you very soon in the next one. Take care. Hey guys, Mike here. Welcome back to 
episode three of my little trip around the north of Sweden. It's June 25th, but it's quite late in the day as I set off quite late from the other camp as I did a fair bit of housekeeping before I left. The weather was good, the wind was warm, so I aired out my sleeping bag, I washed myself, I washed my clothes, I cleaned the inside of the vehicle a little bit, just a bit of housekeeping, just to tidy things up a little bit. It's always good to do that when you're traveling and you're not staying on campsites with showers and stuff, just because it makes you feel more ready and refreshed for the next part of the trip. But uh, there's a lot of Sami around here and a lot of reindeer as um, the two go hand in hand. The Sami people obviously farm reindeer and uh, you've got to be quite careful when you're driving around here. I take it very steady in the Jeep, but then I'm the kind of person I like to travel slowly and I'm very conscious about the vehicle, the weight of the vehicle and my stopping distance is something you need to really bear in mind when you drive a, a vehicle that's fully kitted out like that. I tend to just pull over, look at the map and uh, you know, five minutes go by, they've, they've gone off into the forest anyway and you can carry on with your trip. On the topic of reindeer, I drove down a, a really nice track with a bit of a mountainous terrain in the background. I saw a beautiful lake, I looked on Guy, it was a road that took you to a turnaround point as they often do around here. And I thought that looks a good place to spend the night, do some fishing, maybe even put the boat in the water. And I drove down this track and it had reindeer fencing across it. Be it the fencing was destroyed, fencing still means the same thing whether destroyed or not, so I'm not going to go over it. But out of curiosity, I got out of the car, had a look around, it was a pretty bad area. Someone had obviously trashed the, the place and trashed the fence. So I thought, oh, I'll spend some time here, I'll have a cup of tea and look at Gaia. And less than five minutes went by and this pickup truck came behind me, quite a nice vehicle actually, and it pulled real close behind my Jeep. And a guy got out and uh, he started looking at the vehicle. I said hi to him, he didn't really respond too well. It's often the way it goes around here. And he started asking me some questions about the car, the tires, the tent on the roof, all sorts of stuff, you know, where I was from, what I was doing. Showed him, the, you know, he obviously saw the camera, although I wasn't filming because that'd be kind of weird, you know, told him where I lived in South Lapland and you know my wife and son were meant to be with me but they can't be and I, I'm just spending time on my own in nature and just trying to get out the way and find places that, that are away from people, away from the camper vans. And he's pointed me to this track that's in front of me here. So it looks pretty good. There is a, apparently a kind of a bridge thing or something he said. I can't re I didn't really understand too much what he said but he said it might be a bit dilapidated in that respect. And, but he, but he, he seemed to think it'll be okay in my truck. So I'm gonna go down there, have a look. There's a load of lakes around there. You know, hopefully it's a nice spot and I'm getting kind of desperate because it is late in the day. Um, and I really need to find somewhere to camp. So we'll see how it goes.
I'm going to bring you inside the cab with me now because this trail is much of the same thing although it is getting worse and worse it's just starting to become a little bit a little bit worrying actually at this point, I couldn't help but feel like this was where the unwanted tourists were sent to never return. I scout ahead to see what the rest of the track is like, and it's deteriorated, from gravel and stone to waterlogged earth. I'm certain though that this is the right place, as he marked it with me on Gaia GPS, but this just adds to my uncertainty, so it's time to turn back while the ground is still dry. I have no armour on my differential at the back and you can see I just clipped a rock. If it would have hammered that case in, it would have been the end. I would have been going home in two wheel drive. I had to take the prop shaft out. It would, it would have just been insane. Um, I wouldn't have got away without a million mosquito bites either. <sighs> so uh, we've turned round. Everything looks okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of here. trail the rest of it is isn't difficult you know another another sort of 200 meters and it's it's kind of just a few rocks and things but anyway exploration has cost us time but bought us many a fly bite my arms are like knickknacks i'm gonna have a cup of tea i'm gonna think it over
little bit of a jump forward in time. I traveled about another hour east and found this location here just by chance actually. I was driving along, uh, spotted the track, thought, you know, it could be somebody's cabin, for example, so you never know. Um, and Guy wasn't really telling me the full story. So I came down here and it's a little boat launch place. Um, and I've parked out the way actually so vehicles can still come down and, and access the boat launch if they wish to but it's probably more like on the weekend somebody would do that you can probably see all the mozzies around me i've fired up the thermocell about 15 minutes it'll take that to uh, start working and then i can take the mask off and uh, gonna get some food cooked and set the roof tent up and get get ready for the night beautiful view in front of me and actually quite a fast flowing river um, there's two sets of rapids for such a wide river it's moving very quickly I think if I put the blow up in without an anchor I'm gonna have a very difficult time controlling it and that's one thing I'd like to sort out on that boat to get some rope and uh, obviously I, I guess I'll just use a rock of some description and try to steady myself out so I can sit in one spot and fish but I will attempt some fishing tonight the water's very clear perfect to have a swim in tomorrow morning all my clothes are dry which is brilliant and you'll probably notice that all around my face is a, a tiny fly uh, called knot um, the pronunciation varies actually depending on you know other parts of Scandinavia but they they, they do bite you um, and draw blood and normally you don't really feel it you just kind of do this and then there's there's kind of blood down your arm because the cannot have, have sort of bitten it not a lot just a tiny tiny amount um i mean they draw blood like mosquitoes but just in a different way with incisors but you can see the thermosal does nothing to deter them i have no mosquitoes anywhere around me that's great that the thermosal works for them those big horse flies those brems they've uh, kind of cleared off which is cool but the knots don't, they don't care. <laughs> I remember in Norway, they were extremely bad in, in one particular location. And it, and it was up in the mountains where it was at the worst, I think, with that, with that particular fly. Um, and we're relatively high up now. Just seen a fish come straight up. I've had dinner, I'm gonna have a cup of tea. I'm gonna be patient. I don't know what species of fish that was, but I need to put some time in tonight. My fishing over this trip has been terrible. I've just caught smaller body, which, which is perch. Um, no yedder, so no pike, no trout, nothing really. I mean, I had some fantastic fishing the day before I left near where I live. But then you see, I know a lot of locations where I live. You know, you, you get familiar with it. You speak to the guys, you, you know a lot about fishing. They say, try here, try there try this try that and then you start getting success and you start figuring it out in those particular areas but <coughs> flies jesus christ they just don't leave you alone they're like salesmen <sighs> try this lure for a while just because it means I don't get stuck if there's anything out there I don't know about.
Interesting what I said earlier about thermosal really working. Look, mosquitoes, thousands, thousands of mosquitoes. They're just everywhere. They just, just all suddenly appeared in the last 10 minutes. The thermosal tablet's pretty new. Just thousands of them. Good morning. Well, it's not too bad. My forehead became the, the feast of the night. And if you look up, there's a lot of mosquitoes around here. A lot of them. And a lot of them got in. Um, in fact, loads of them are getting in and they've been getting in all night. And I don't know where. They're getting in in multiple places. So uh, that's a bit of a shame, you know. I mean, there's obviously somewhere in the rooftop tent, some, some areas, probably the fold area here, is where I've suspected they might be getting in and I packed socks and stuff down there. But it still didn't seem to make any difference. I mean, 30, 40 getting in. I've been getting woken up all night, really, by, by mosquitoes kind of buzzing around my head and, and then, you know, having a drink of my brains. But uh, hopefully they're just around the roof tent now. It's warm enough in the morning that they're probably just sheltering under the rooftop tent. It's interesting in the sleeping area. This is this is basically it. Um, it's a, a pretty comfortable area. It's a bit like it's, it's like a bed at home. I mean, I sleep up he up here just as well as I sleep at home, if not better, because you've got the sounds of the birds and the river, and the light doesn't really bother me. Um, but the sleeping bag is a Constellation Lux Double. Obviously, it's a double bag because me and my wife uh, obviously both use this rooftop tent quite frequently. And the mat itself is an inflatable, like I've said before. And that's an X bed. And uh, that's about 140. I can't remember the measurements of it, but I'll put the link in the description. And obviously, you can, you can blow that up and, and let it down. And the advantage of that is... Uh, it allows me to compress all of this, minus the pillows, up here in the rooftop tent, keeping a lot of space free on the inside. Wow. This is a pretty heavy mosquito location. Can't say I've experienced this many. Incredible. No wonder they're getting in. Right here. Check that before I get a bed every night. It's pretty easy to see how they were getting in just here. That flap was open like that, and they were going between the two joins of the aluminium floor and coming up, and there are thousands of them around the vehicle, around the rooftop tent, just under here. I mean the thermocell will do very little, I don't think. I mean last night. I had it fired up trying to sort of deal with this, but clearly I've created a safe haven for these things from the sun and they're making full use of it.
I was thinking this morning I'd go for a swim and uh, have a wash, get a few things done, make some breakfast, but uh, the mosquitoes in this area, um, pretty heavy, really. Hands are devoured and I think I'm just gonna make a move. I've got about two and a half hour drive past Yokmok to my friend's place today. So I'm gonna uh, get on the road, get out of this place anyway, and then pull up somewhere and make myself some breakfast and uh, continue with my morning routine. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to get out of here as soon as I could really. Places on Gaia GPS that get labelled Mjög Hell, Mjög meaning mosquito in Swedish. But uh, that place, uh, that, that took the record for it. I was very disappointed in the front runner uh, tent. I've not experienced that before, probably because the, the volume of mosquitoes was so high. And uh, I mean, there must have been over a hundred mosquitoes in my tent that night. And uh, it was a pretty, pretty irritating night. It got to the point where I just put earplugs in. And I just let them eat me because I just got so tired of hearing the noise and being woken up by it. Anyway, let's flush them out. Flush them out the airlock. See you later, assholes. That's it for me on this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to make my way to Yokmok now, well, past Yokmok, just east of it, and uh, spend some time with a friend of mine there. And uh, yeah, then I'm going to pick up the journey and I'm going to decide what to do when I'm at his house. I'm going to check the maps and maybe I go further east and I go down the east coast of Sweden. Not done that, very beautiful. Or maybe I just carry on going west. Um, or go back west and go through the fjells, although that's difficult because a lot of the roads don't link up. They essentially just go out like like a like a leaf, for example. You have a main road going all the way up, and then and then all these these other roads going off to the side, but they don't technically link up. They take you into Norway, and those borders are closed. Um, but the east coast is definitely doable. Um, or I could go further north and miss out uh, that ta uh, that village or that town about 100 kilometers north of Jokmok that has the corona outbreak and this is primarily why I'm not stopping in towns I filled up once filled my fuel tank up once on this trip and obviously um, here in Sweden the boutiques you just pay with card on a machine use your hand sanitizer and go so you're, you're pretty much you don't have to worry about people in this part of the world in that respect 
But uh, this is a beautiful spot, isn't it? It's better on the flies because there's a, there's a bit of a wind coming in. They've taken shelter behind the Jeep, but I could quite easily rectify that by spinning it round if I spent the night here and um, opening the windows so, so the wind punched through the car and they wouldn't like that. But this is why it's taken me so long to, to just get to Jokmok, which isn't really that far north in Sweden. It can go much further than that and I probably won't have time to. Wow, look, they found me already. This is Knott, um, a different type of fly again. But, uh, well, I, I told you about those in another episode, I'm sure. Must repeat myself a million times in this, but you kind of forget what you're saying when you're five or six SD cards in and, you know, three or four days into the trip. I think this is the fifth day now I've been traveling. So, uh, yeah, but, um, Totally forgot what I was saying, but yeah, not this is why it takes so long to, to for me anyway, because I end up stopping in these places and I end up exploring tracks and trails and going off into the mountains and stuff and doing little hikes and little fishing here and there. And you can really take your time. You can really take your time traveling. I mean, if you like nature like me, then these places, they just, they just suck you in. Just being here does something to you. Um, and it's really, it's a really beautiful thing. So uh, that's why I do it. <laughs> anyway, stop talking. I'm gonna carry on uh, going east and I'll see you guys in a couple of days um, when I'm either heading east, north or west or south. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, Mike here. Welcome back to another episode of my little adventure traveling around the north of Sweden. And uh, the last time you saw me, I would have been about 700 kilometers further north in Jokmok. So I spent a bit of time there, about three days with some friends of mine. Jokmok's a really beautiful place. Nice to be there. Nice to have a look around. First time for me. Picked up some new trousers as well, just for the warm temperatures. I had some, some pretty heavy pine woods on for most of the trip. So I got these ones here made by North Bend, really like them. Not a sponsored video, just saying, because I might get asked what trousers I'm wearing in the description and just good for hiking and stuff really in warm weather. But I stopped off at this little place last night. You've got a little teepee there. You can see behind me with an interesting stove and definitely somewhere I've marked on the map for winter. I'm gonna come back here, maybe do some cooking, maybe camp out in there, get the stove going, be perfect for those cold nights. And I'm about 35 kilometers away from where I live. I was going to travel further north, as I said, 
or do the east coast but I spoke to Megan and Max on WhatsApp uh, while I was at my mate's house and basically just really, really missed them. I wanted to get closer to home, wanted to be closer to them. And I thought I'd do the last couple of days of my camping experience around here and kind of show you some places that are near where I live and some places I fish. And this river next to me is called the Ongamon Elven. It's a very big river and it's a very popular river for fishermen. But I caught some decent fish while I was up in Yokmok, two big perch, just around a kilo and I've um, got those on ice. Hopefully they'll be totally defrosted by the end of play today. We're gonna go further up the river here to Stenkula, which is essentially a hydro dam, one of the two dams that provide electricity for, for where I live really, and other places too, I presume. And there's some great fishing there. Obviously lots of little fish go into the, the turbine, they get shredded up. So you just have loads of really good fish there basically feeding on the, the bits of the small fish that get shredded up and killed in the turbine of the dam. So it's not the most natural place to fish, but you know what, it's the north of Sweden. Everywhere's really wilderness around here and it is very beautiful despite being a dam. So I'm gonna catch some good fish. We're gonna get them fried up tonight, do some breaded fish in the pan, hopefully have a nice meal. And that'll sign off my last night of uh, being out here and uh, traveling around. And I'm gonna head home and see my family because I do miss them dearly. But I just want to say thanks to Harold and Yvonne up in the north there, up in Yokmok. Thanks for having me for a couple of days. Thanks for feeding me, letting me have a shower. And Harold, thank you very much for the gifts you gave me. Uh, Harold gave me a CB radio uh, for the Jeep, which I've installed there. You'll see the antenna on the front and I've mounted that inside the cab. And he also gave me a really nice fishing rod. Um, I've known Harold for a while and the reason he gave me those things, I, I can't really go into on video. Bit of a sad story actually, and I hope you don't mind me saying that, Harold, but you know, you know, thank you so much, and you know I'll use that rod and uh you know I'll catch some good fish with it for the rest of my life. So thanks mate, and I really hope to see you soon. But uh getting eaten alive again, rained last night, perfect conditions for me being seasoned for the flies. So uh let's go further up river up this track and let's do some fishing. journey south was pretty interesting. Um, I stopped off at a lot of points actually and it was really nice to do some night driving. It doesn't really get dark at this time of year although it's significantly darker down here. Saw some beautiful waterfalls, um, stopped off at some some really really nice places just to kind of sort of see them on the map because I had them marked from what I've been looking at doing some research online. Interestingly enough, stumbled across a, an old runway, an old airbase, which was which was kind of nice, and you know some really interesting roads along there, and just really beautiful rivers. I, I followed one particular river for, for quite a long way, and there were some fantastic camp spots along it, really beautiful, and lots of kids having parties along the side of the river. I don't know whether I just caught uh, caught some sort of. Uh, annual thing at a particular time of year something that people do because you know obviously we have something similar here up uh, in, in Orsula so yeah I mean yeah it was really really nice I had a great trip back and uh, obviously a little bit tired too but flies are well just got hit there mofo got me
Wow. She's going today. That's a nice spot over there though. Go up on those rocks there. You fish down in there. Pretty nice spot too. I like it over there. You can see how high it is. Normally I'm standing just along here. And uh, you know, standing on all these rocks that you can see under the water. So it's come up about a metre or so. But uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Maybe it means good fishing. Kind of where I thought they'd be, down in these rocks here. I tried a bit further down, lost the lure. It was a really bad spot, so I'm just trying here. But that's a pretty decent sized one. It's not too bad really for a perch. So we'll get that in the pot, or in the bag even. And we can have that tonight. Get some breadcrumbs on it, fry it up, it should be great. But we'll keep trying, because there's probably some really big ones down there. This is the lure I'm using. They're really great for, uh, for perch, actually. Pretty much don't really use anything else. I mean, they get shredded up. You just buy another one and they're really cheap. But this rod is obviously way too large for what I'm doing here, but I really want to use it. So, you know, you don't need such a massive rod either. That's what she said. Try again. Playing it down here. Pretty deep. So this is a really good sized perch. Probably, uh, probably just under a kilo actually. So that that's really nice for a perch, but it will definitely be beating that one. So get that in the bag and then we'll prepare it later. It's a nice size. There's loads down there and they're all about this big. So uh, it's a great spot. I just need to keep them, uh, keep them out of the sun really. Keep them in this bag. Tiny. God, that felt pretty good. That put up a fight. Put that one back. There we go. Oh. Hopefully, it's not tiny like it is. Man, these ones are putting up a fight. Making themselves feel a uh, lot bigger than they really are. Still a still a good sized perch, but uh, yeah, we got a couple of good sized ones now. I think we can afford to be a bit more selective about what we're catching. Fishing's been okay here. Turbulent water's been a bit bit sort of tough to deal with at times, but. Yeah, some good sized perch, but I'm going to make my way over to the gates. It's not the prettiest place to fish, but you do pull some whoppers out there. So, you know, some really big perch, you know, over, over one and a half kilo. So, um, yeah, going to go jump back in the Jeep, make my way over there. Got to drive back over the dam, park the other side and then walk down. So that chap's gone now. He's much further down there. He's obviously after the earring, the trout. So another good place to get them over by the gates, but we'll see.
here we are deep in the wilderness well kind of are really in a way but um yeah this this thing is flowing pretty aggressively the water level's a lot higher but um usually all along this wall here is pretty good along the wall to the back there although you're technically not not allowed to be there but that's where i've had the best success thanks to a chap in Orsula who works at a place called Volk who told me it was a good place so and he's right he catches a lot of fish here um, and at the back there too I mean you know I fished over there a lot and that's a really good spot but we'll just have to see how it is just try and fish deep it's going to be hard to put the, put the lure where we want it to be They were where, where I thought they'd be, just trying to get the lure in the right spot really, just down here, this wall. But uh, that's alright. That is pretty good. I uh, think I might let that one go though, you know, because uh, we kind of have enough. And uh, the only time I'm going to really keep one more is if it's of a very, very large size. Well, not very large, but of a, of a decent size. You're going back there. But that is that is a nice size perch. Just gonna be a bit more selective because I have two one kilo ones now, one just under one kilo, and then two more that are sort of relatively small. So in all honesty, that although the, the fillets are pretty small that you get off them, um, I do have other food as well, so I don't just want to catch tons of fish and you know have these tiny little pathetic fillets just just for the sake of killing them I, you know if I catch a good one I'll keep it but uh, and, th and then we're done really so we'll just keep fishing here for a while see what comes up I've just done some bushwhacking managed to get to here not too bad actually a lot of people have fished here before me so there was quite an easy trail to follow but, uh, just gonna go up on these rocks try again looks like a pretty useful place actually even to just camp First dip in the water, that's the size we're talking about. Obviously been eating little fish, so hungry one. That's a really good eating size. I think if you start to get a lot, lot bigger, they're not so great. So around this size is, is ideal. So I mean, you know, we've got some pretty good fish. I don't think as much meat comes off them as you think, but We'll try again for another big one.
another really good one. Nice size. I think that's it for me fishing in this location. I've got two more perch in this spot and they're of a good size, you know, eatable, around a kilo, just under. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'm gonna use this small stream in front of me here just to whip them open, get the guts out, clean my hands, and then I'm gonna put them back in the bag and then we're gonna go find somewhere to camp. The weather's certainly brightened up and uh, that was some decent fishing, I'm really happy with that. It's nice to catch some uh, some perch that's of a, of a reasonable size really that makes it worth actually taking home and eating. And don't get me wrong, you can end up with a lot of meat just by taking small perch home. I'm not uh, sizest in any way when it comes to fish. But uh, yeah, you know, it's less work and uh, when you're doing the kind of fillets that I'm going to be doing later with the breadcrumbs and, and everything else and you're frying them. It's nice to do something of a, of a decent size but you can do it with small fish especially in the winter when you're doing pimpling and you're, you're catching little ones but uh, now it's time to find somewhere to camp and I've got a couple of locations in mind. Two places where I've camped before and also two places where I've parked the vehicle, gone off on a boat and also uh, gone off on foot. So we're going to follow follow this forest road now, and uh, well, this gravel road, I should say, because that's what it actually is. It's a gravel road, and it's going to take us to a, a nice little spot. I just drove all this way 
down this uh, track here and it looks like someone's beat me to it. I think it's actually the, the people from Thailand who come to pick berries. Um, it's that time of year. I thought because of the coronavirus they weren't allowed in the country but I think they've just allowed that again so there's kind of an influx of people berry picking. But this is a really nice uh, little spot actually. Uh, sometimes me and my friends camp here. This cabin you can't really go in because it's, the structure's falling apart inside and it's not really safe but around the back you can do some grilling, you can make a fire kind of here where it's gravel and you know that you're not going to run into any issues and it's got a beautiful nature reserve just up there which is fantastic for canoeing through. Me and Megan canoed through here in 2016 and I was hoping to come back here with a friend of mine from the UK who might be visiting and we'll canoe up here, do some fishing and find a place to camp on an island. But uh, I'll show you around. When I first came here, it was pretty dilapidated actually, the, the road that took you here. But the commune, I think, have recently put a bit of money in here fixing this bridge and walkway that takes you off to the reserve and also strimming back all the hedges so you've got vehicular access but uh, yeah I was going to camp here tonight but um, maybe I won't we'll see maybe I'll hang around a while have a cup of tea see whether these guys come back and ask them whether they're staying here the night it's very doubtful I'm pretty sure they're picking berries time hopefully uh, you can hear me past the wind this is kind of an interesting place because the wind is exactly what you want really for the mosquitoes um, I've got a little bit of shelter from the trees but you can see out on the lake there and uh, somebody's put some benches and stalls and stuff there but I'll leave that alone that's not mine I've got my own stuff so I'm gonna set up camp now and um, hopefully get some dinner on because I'm pretty hungry So that's camp all set up and uh, yeah, it doesn't take long but I'm kind of used to doing it now. Just going to make sure this is closed, unlike in the last video you saw the, the mosquitoes take me down big time but uh, yeah I think with this wind here we're not going to have a problem he says but then I'm out of the wind a little bit so they're going to move in on me now but uh, I don't mind one or two it's when there's hundreds it's a problem. I'm going to get dinner on and uh, we're going to get this fish sorted out and prepared. The reason I thought this camp spot would be great as well, just because um, yeah, you've got the water there and I can wash my hands and I can wash the fish and just keep some hygiene together instead of being out in the forest where uh, you know I need to use my own water that I've got inside there. So um, yeah, let's prepare some food.
I've been busy filleting these perch, trying to get them ready. And uh, I thought I'd show you the method in which I use to fillet them. You're always going to lose some meat when you fillet a fish, unless you're extremely experienced. But then again, you will always lose some meat. But you can minimise that, of course. You don't necessarily need to remove the guts either. With this method, I just did it because I'm driving around all day and it gives me peace of mind. But um, first thing really is I remove the head and, and a serrated knife works pretty well for this. I don't have that with me. So I use this field master knife here, which is extremely sharp and pretty hard steel. So I don't worry about it too much. Just need to give it a strop later. And take the head off. Again, you've still got a bit of meat around there. So, you know, you've just got to factor in that this is this is kind of, you're going to have a bit of loss. It's not like cooking it around a campfire like we did with the pike or putting it in tin foil with some lemon. Um, you have the ribs here and obviously the spinal cord just here. And you want to send the knife in just above that line there on the first fillet and then just under it for the second. And um, you're essentially putting the knife either side of the ribs and you'll kind of feel the ribs as you put the knife down. Um, if you're working on a really slippery surface like me, then it makes it even harder. It might even be better without the chopping board. Yeah, it is. So you can bring the knife out and then you can sort of feel the ribs, put the knife out down the underside of the fish and then draw the knife down. Just like that. So essentially we've we've run one side down the ribs there. And then you're going to want to start kind of loosening the meat off. You can sometimes save a little bit. You can kind of angle the knife in and you just hear the knife kind of chattering along the ribs, just like that. And you can do it really quickly if you want. I kind of take my time, as I do with most things. So, kind of get an idea of what I'm doing. And as we get nearer the bottom, the kind of angle changes a little bit if you really want to savour as much as possible. Um, you kind of then start to tilt under just like so. You can kind of just free that up with your fingers, just like this. And open that up. And you can just then free that one side. Just being pretty careful because obviously it's, uh, you know, the scales are pretty hard. And then you've got one side like that ready to take the skin off in a little while. You can see we've lost a little bit here because you know I'm, I'm not the best at this kind of thing. Um, but you do lose a little bit here and there unless you, you're really, really good. And then you send the knife up the other side of that line. This knife, uh, I sharpened it actually the other day. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's a terrible knife. <laughs> Because it's done already after just a few fish. Then you can uh, you can even flip that over if you care a lot about what you get at the back. And then we just do the same really. So put your thumb in there, angle the knife down a bit, start to work that off. And then uh, if you if you rip too early actually then then you will just pull away some of the meat so whilst you're doing this just bear in mind that you know, it's good to just kind of take your time a bit with it like I haven't done there I've done a, a bad job of that bit 
you know, it's okay. Guess that's why you catch more than one fish, but uh, we take that off the back there. Um, that's kind of everything really you don't want. I mean, obviously there is some meat stored in here, but you've got you know, everything out and the guts will come out as one as well if you leave those in. And then you're left with the skin on. If you have a fish board with a clip, and what that is, it's like this, but it just has a clip there. And you can clip the, the back there. It's much easier. Um, I don't have that. I've just got fingernails, which is kind of irritating. But with one of these knives, they're quite uh, they're quite flexible, so they can go in like that, and then you can just take the the fillet off or the fillet off. Sorry, I'm too used to being in another country. And the same with this one here. I uh, learnt this method just, just on YouTube really, just by watching videos. I didn't know how to do it. And I always used to cook stuff just whole on a fire. And I wanted to start taking fish home and kind of having other recipes and things. And uh, this was kind of how I started doing it. Um, I can't remember the name of the video I watched, but you can uh, have a look in the description, I'll put it in there. So we've got a couple of, of bones just here. But they're going to be kind of hard to get out. Obviously when I did that top bit there, I took a few with me. Just, just two or three. And that's it, they're all out now. So they're pretty nice, actually. Probably two of the best ones I've done. And uh, we'll do the last one. Well, a little bit of a jump forward in time and uh, it was probably a really good job, but I decided to drive all the way back here and be only about 25 kilometers from where I live because as I was about to get started cooking, I got a phone call from Meg and it was a bit of an emergency and uh, she was just a bit worried and I just packed up, went home straight away. She didn't even know I was I was that close, so she was pretty surprised to hear where I was because we know that spot and we've camped there ourselves before. It's actually her favourite spot. Um, so yeah, I, I obviously shot home and uh, you know packed everything up. But I did put the fish fillets in the fridge and obviously kept all my ingredients. And, uh, and I thought to myself, that's a real shame of a way to end the video. You know, I decided to pack all my stuff up today. It's just the following day, come out and uh, show you guys the recipe I was gonna show you. Be it an extremely simple recipe and lots of people do this, it's very easy to do. And you can kind of do it with all sorts of different meats and it just kind of puts a bit of morale in your belly, especially on the cold nights. But I've got everything set up here and I'll show you my ingredients and then we'll get started and we'll we'll cook some food up because I'm pretty hungry, it's lunchtime now. I've got some of the main ingredients here, apart from the fish, the fillets are in there wrapped up, keeping cool, and it's fresh fish, so you know, really you want to eat it within a few days unless you freeze it. But I've just got some basic wheat flour, got some breadcrumbs here. Obviously, this is from Ica, so you know it's all in Swedish, but I'm sure you can find the equivalent in your country. Got some eggs, probably only really need one or two at most, depending on how much fish you've got. Just some oil, you can use whatever oil you really like. This is just some rapeseed oil, not the best, but for, for outings like this, it's okay. And this is citron pepper, which is kind of like pepper, salt, and lemon. Just an all round seasoning that I use when I, I'm out camping. I just carry it in the alu box in the back of the truck when I'm doing whatever, really. First, I'm just going to grab an egg, go for a big one. That'll do. Doesn't need to have a whole yolk, so you can be a bit aggressive with it. Just going to get that whisked up. probably do. Don't know what we'll call that. <laughs> Two fingers of oil. But uh, yeah, won't fire that up just yet. Gonna get the fish, probably put them on this chopping board, let them stand for a while. Not too long or else it'll go soggy. And then we'll kind of get a bit of a conveyor belt going and get the fish in. These are the same fillets from the other day. This is the perch. You saw me fill it basically at camp last night. I didn't get a chance to do the cooking. Um, you can towel dry them a bit first, that tends to help, but we'll just take one, 
pop them in the flour like that. Make sure you get a nice bit of flour on it. And then it won't be all sort of sticky to hold. Go in the egg like that. Make sure you have a bit of egg on there. Looks good. And then get it in the breadcrumbs. You can kind of pad the crumbs down a bit. But you don't want to go too crazy. You don't want loads of egg all over it or else it will go soggy and it won't be quite as crispy. So um, there's one there. And then we just keep going through the motions. Grab another fillet. Flour. Bit of egg. Get the excess off. In the crumbs. There we go, there's another one ready for the pan. They can kind of just rest on top of each other for a bit. That's a pretty good one right there. It's good to get some big perch really. Because then you get a decent fillet off of it. Although small ones, as I said, are pretty good too. Now we've got a few of these bad boys waiting to go on. We'll just fire up the stove. Get that oil nice and hot. And we can get them in. Three minutes each side should do. It's good. I'm starving. Really hungry. I got home last night, I hadn't had any dinner. I didn't have any dinner before we went to bed because we, we were rushing around everywhere. And um, obviously woke up this morning and thought, you know, I'd like to I'd like this fish to be as fresh as it can be really. Cooks really quick though. Look at that. Looking good. But uh, yeah, that's what I was planning anyway for my meal yesterday evening. And um, it would have been a great meal. One thing I did have planned with it was some chips. It's gonna dice up a little bit of potato, get that sort of boiled and semi-cooked then in the pan. And then those to one side, you know, you can let those kind of cool off because they're just chips at the end of the day. And then you can get the fish rolling. And then you've got fish and chips in the bush, really, in, in the forest. So. Now, there's nothing really better than, than catching um, than catching something fresh and, and cooking it. If you, if you are a meat eater, obviously, if you're not, then uh, you know you can bring things with you and, and do the same recipe, you know, with with vegetables and various other things too. But it is extremely tasty. Um, you know, you can obviously add a bit of salt to it too, into the breadcrumbs like this citron pepper in the crumbs as well, just to you know, add a little bit of something more to it, but it's really satisfying actually after a day of driving or hiking or whatever to do something like this. And you can always use then the flour and the breadcrumbs and the eggs and other things for kind of various other meals while you're out there to make bread and flatbreads and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this segment of what was meant to be part of my kind of overland traveling uh, video from yesterday. And this really was the last episode, so um, I guess this is where I sadly end the video. But um, you know, it's not going to be, it's certainly not the last video I'll do like this, so don't worry. Um, it's just I need to go home, I need to spend some time with Megan and Max because I've been away for 10 days. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, I'll see you again very soon. Take care. And I'm going to gorge myself on 
the rest of this fish and then fall asleep. Oh my god. Wow.